We're with Laura Fees at the USS Hornet Museum in Alameda, and she will start at the beginning with the earliest aircraft carrier. We're standing in front of a model. Hello. Um, we are actually in a prime location to be discussing the evolution of the aircraft carrier, and in fact, this early rendition of an aircraft carrier in general. Uh, this is the USS Pennsylvania, and it's uh, particularly pertinent to us because it was in the San Francisco Bay during the first landing of an aircraft on a, a carrier, I'll say. I use the air quotes because this carrier was a normal ship that they just kind of slapped a uh, wooden deck on top of, and it was an experiment, so that was good enough for the experiment. Um, here you can see our large-scale model of this, the USS Pennsylvania, and here uh, you can see what basically looks like a Wright Brothers plane, and that's because it almost is. Um, this took place in 1911, so Wright Brothers built their first, had their first flight in 1903. It's not a handful of years after that uh, first invention of the aircraft. So here we see our really rudimentary biplane. Um, the brave fella who's piloting it. His name is Eugene Ely. Uh, now, Mr. Ely had previously in the year uh, been the first pilot to take off of a ship, a stationary ship, and that was actually in uh, Virginia. But now they needed to test the landing on a ship, the second part of an aircraft carrier. So he agreed to uh, team up with the Navy, and he was the best test pilot and uh, most brazen, and he strapped up it's uh, kind of hard to see from this far away, but he's wearing basically an old leather football helmet, and he knew he was going to be landing above water, so he has two uh, bike tubes strapped across his chest because water landings, he could float, little floaties. And he prepped himself for the landing, and they had to think about this because they didn't know how long it would take the plane to stop on the ship. And I think you could just see on this model, we have a rendition, uh, this, this ship had smokestacks. Yeah, you didn't want to hit the smokestacks. <laughs> so what they did is, how can we stop the plane faster? So they took some rope, and they tied sandbags to the end of these ropes, and they laid about 20 down on the deck. And how are they going to catch these ropes? It's good to have some stoppers, but how are you going to hook onto it? Uh, hook was the essential term there, because they went to the local butchers, pretty much, found a butcher's hook, and it's hard to see but it's just on the bottom back end between the two back wheels of this plane. And so, a very simple idea. Hook, butcher's hook, ropes, catches on whatever rope he finds himself at, and that will jerk the plate, uh, plane to a stop. It'll be before it hits the smokestacks, which is what happened. Uh, this is all a huge risk, but it worked beautifully. Ely landed the plane, it caught the hook caught the ropes, and he had lunch with the captain and then took off again. It was a perfect experiment. Uh, it worked so well, in fact, that the essential theory of how aircraft carriers launch and land has stayed the same for over 100 years now. We've gotten a little bit more technologically advanced, but uh, we still have the rope and hook system. Our ropes are now called arresting gear cables. They're about uh, yay thick of uh, steel cable. And uh, the hooks are actually just hooks still. <laughs> it's not that much fancier. But... Uh, yeah, it, aircraft that are meant to land on carriers have the hook drops down, they catch the cable, and they're slammed to a stop on the deck. And uh, it's worked. And, and now I think we're actually going to be going up to the flight deck to get a little bit more uh, in-person view of Hornet's flight deck. So we're in flight deck control right now, which is uh, on the flight deck level. It's inside the island, which is our superstructure on the ship. And here we have the Ouija board, which is a good representation of Hornet's flight deck. Uh, this would have been used while we were in operation, and essentially there are people here um, who mapped out where the planes were. You can see the uh, planes were just cut out, and they could shuffle them around as the planes were moved in real time, and it was easier for them to track and then report the plane's movements and uh, if there was any issues to the air boss. The air boss was in charge of planes on the flight deck, in the hangar bay, and within five nautical miles of the ship. And the air boss did his business in the basically the control tower of the aircraft carrier. And that's kind of four decks up from here in a glass window area. And he would look down on the flight deck. And he would have people behind him, phone talkers, who would be on sound-powered headphones. 
and they'd be talking to people down here and communicating any issues or problems or updates. Now when the Airbus looked down at the flight deck, there would be hundreds of people working on here any, on any daily basis, night or day, it doesn't matter. And, and to make sure they were all in the right place, the people who work on the flight deck and that's still true today are actually color coded. So there's, we call them the Skittles here on board, but you would have a uh, red, yellow, green, purple, brown, uh, blue, and they'd all have different jobs. For instance, the people who wore the red shirts were, worked the ordnance, so they were the ones who loaded any bombs or ammunition on the aircraft. Uh, brown shirts were plane captains, uh, people in the purple shirts did aviation fuel, so they each had one specific or a few specific jobs, and that's what they did on the flight deck. And it was this coordinated dance of aircraft and men as they worked around. And it needed to be this coordinated and detailed because the flight deck is a very dangerous place to work. That's still true today. It's one of the most dangerous places in the world to work. Uh, today, as a museum, we have fencing along the entire flight deck. That wasn't true back while this was in operation. In fact, the best they had for safety was uh, netting just underneath the flight deck that if you were blown off or fell off, you might be able to fall into the netting. Uh, but especially when the advent of jets came onto this ship or any ship, uh, one, one wrong move and you might be slightly behind a jet blast and you're pop, pop off the ship. Um, so lots of dangers. Uh, back in this day, World War II, they probably didn't even have proper sound here, sound equipment or sound protection rather. So uh, nowadays they're finding that World War II vets and other older vets who worked on the Navy ships are losing their hearing, but I'm sure nowadays they have better equipment. But they did work really hard. Uh, this carrier um, has two catapults and it could launch, I think each catapult could be launched every two minutes just about. The bringing the plane up from the hangar deck to the, up via the elevator to the flight deck and then the launch took about yeah, two minutes in total so they could be launching an aircraft every minute because they worked the two catapults at once if they needed to. That was in battle situations. Um, the ship was only really in battle during World War II. Otherwise, after its career uh, during the Pacific Theater, which it fought about 59 battles, uh, it kind of settled back into more uh, reconnaissance, which was a very important job, but more like anti-submarine warfare activity where they would mostly be launching uh, trackers and that sort of thing. But it was always busy. Even if they weren't actively fighting, they were doing some sort of at least uh, testing or uh, training. So. Flight deck on an aircraft carrier, always busy, always dangerous, always on the move. After this, we will be going down to see Hornet's final service uh, during her commission years, and that was picking up Apollos 11 and 12. So here we have an example of a command module. Now this is the Block 1 type, and it was built in Downey, California by a offset of the North American Aviation Company and it was built in 1966. Uh, now there was two types of command module. There was a block one and the block two. The block one was built before they even knew they wanted to orbit the moon. It was in 1966, they didn't have their mission for the Apollo missions quite uh, so explicitly written out. So this was designed to go uh, out of Earth's orbit or at least explore low Earth orbit. But it wasn't until the block two design that they added things like the crew transfer tunnel. With this block one design, uh, if you can see inside a little bit, you can see that the panels are pictures of what the Apollo command module panels would have been. And if you can come aboard one day and see, you'll, the couches are kind of just fixed in. They weren't actually installed in this particular command module. And that's because all the space inside was filled with recording data, or equipment rather, to get data about the, the ride it took into space. And they did use a Saturn V rocket, and they were testing with it the uh, two, first two launch phases of the Saturn V rocket. Could this command module survive on top of it? Uh, and could this command module survive the pressure of space and uh, the heat of re-entry after low Earth orbit? And it made it. It survived, which is why they continued on with the design and kept pushing and eventually got to that Block 2 design after they realized what new needs uh, would, need, would be needed for the Apollo mission. And one of my favorite things about this particular command model, this very one, uh, which is on loan to us from the Smithsonian, is that we actually, the USS Hornet picked it up. Uh, in 1996, they did the AS-202 mission, and that was where they did shoot it up into low Earth orbit, and it came down right near the Wake Islands, and Hornet was there to pick it up. 
And uh, this was kind of practice for us too. I don't think we knew it at the time, but we would go on, of course, to recover uh, Apollos 11 and 12, the first and second manned missions to the moon. But this was uh, how we got our initial practice on the whole thing. And after the Hornet picked it up and brought it back to America, back to home ground, they actually uh, did a drop test on it. And I really like pointing this out to guests. You can't see it from the front, but if you ever come aboard, you could go around to the back side and see uh, that there's a nice dent on the back. And that's because, you yeah, have a little tiny photo of it here, you might not be able to see it, but they dropped, uh, they dropped the capsule on the ground and it dented. And this was how they figured out, maybe we should land it in water. After this, we're gonna go check out right across uh, the deck to our mobile quarantine facility. So this here is our mobile quarantine facility, or MQF as we call it. And uh, this particular one was used for Apollo 14. Um, it was model 004, which was a prototype right until it was pulled up for Apollo 14. And mobile quarantine facilities were used for Apollos 11, 12, uh, supposed to be 13, and 14. Uh, 13, of course, we didn't end up using an MQF because they never actually touched foot on the moon, so touch ground on the moon, rather. Um, now, mobile quarantine facilities were built ex explicitly, uh, completely because of the fear of moon germs. Uh, and this was a legitimate fear that they had. And to be honest, it was a smart fear to have because having never been on the moon, they didn't know whether or not there was any sort of life. And this could include things like bacteria that you wouldn't otherwise be able to see. So the mobile quarantine facilities were built to uh, start the astronauts quarantine period. And astronauts were quarantined for 21 days. Why they chose 21 days, I don't know, but it seemed to work for NASA. and. So this was where they spent uh, more or less a week, a few days certainly. And the astronauts, when they came aboard the Hornet for 11 and 12, they got out of the helicopter. They had been put into essentially hazmat gear um, before they even left the capsule in the water. And the, the helicopter picked them up in their hazmat gear and they walked straight into the quarantine facility. Now, if you ever get to come aboard, you can check out the quarantine facility through the windows because on that side, there's a series of seats and the seatings uh, looks like airplane seats. They tr had the traditional, you know, the armrest and the seat belt. And the seat belt was the important part because this whole quarantine facility, once the astronauts were encased in it, was then lifted onto, well, it was brought to Hawaii, and it was removed from the Hornet to the ground, and then it was loaded up into a uh, cargo plane, into the back hole of a cargo plane, where it was flown to Texas. And in Texas, they had a larger facility where they could kind of get out and stretch, but until that point, they were here in this trailer. Now this trailer was built by American Standard, but obviously with the great help from Airstream, because uh, it is an Airstream trailer. It's a zooped up Airstream trailer. And they were very, they put a lot of thought into building this mobile quarantine facility. They actually built it so that the air pressure inside was uh, slightly lower than outside. So that if any air got through the cracks, it would come in, not out. Uh, you might be able to see the little hatch here. This was a, uh, transfer tunnel, if you will, for how food could potentially get in or things could get out. You'd have to put it in, close the door, then the other side would open the door and pull it out. It was all very self-contained. Uh, they, they, when the astronauts came aboard, they brought the capsule on. They actually set up a, I call it a plastic dog run, if you will, between the capsule and the quarantine facility so the astronauts could at least get a little bit more room to stretch and go back to the capsule and pull out any, say, moon rock samples that they might have collected or other samples and they kind of start studying it at that point. One fact, fun fact I like about the mobile quarantine facility is that two other people actually went in there with the astronauts. It was equipped to fit six, but I know of two people that went in, and that was they had a, uh, medical, a medical person and a steward, so essentially a person who would cook and clean for them. And I always thought those two guys were the brave ones because while the astronauts were brave enough, these two guys were going in this quarantine facility with three potentially contaminated fellas and who knows what kind of dangerous diseases they could be carrying. Uh, luckily, of course, they all made it. Uh, by, basically, by the end of Apollo 12, uh, scientists had come to the conclusion that there was no life on moon, the moon. Uh, I think they used it for Apollo 14 merely as a formality, and they did stop using mobile quarantine facilities after Apollo 14 when they said for sure 100% no life on the moon, uh, not even a bacteria. Uh, we are, so this did happen. Of course, this mobile quarantine facility was from Apollo 14, but ours would have been aboard for Apollo 11 and 12. 
1969 for Apollo 11. This is, of course, the 50th anniversary of uh, Apollo splashdown when we recovered the Apollo astronauts. Uh, if you want to come back this year in July, uh, we're having a whole week-long splashdown celebration where you get to see the mobile quarantine facility. We'll probably have it open at least for July 20th, so you can actually step inside and see what the astronauts saw. And we'll have a whole bunch of other events. So hope to see you here, and thanks for watching.